Amen. Well, hey, go ahead and grab your Bible if you have one. Um, I'd encourage you to get something on your lap. So if you have to uh, download a Bible, that is okay. But we are going to be in the book of First Thessalonians this morning. That is where we started a brand new series last week. And this is where we're going to be camping out together as a church for the next several weeks together. So let's get there. Let's get it on Our laps in front of us want you to see God's word for yourself this morning. Uh, As you're making your way there, um, I think uh, we probably all share something in common. Um, I think in all of us, to some degree, there is a propensity that we have to uh, desire to do things on our own. Um, Now, maybe that kind of comes out in uh, every area or every aspect of your life, or maybe that just sort of comes up, pops up in different places. But I think this is sort of hardwired into us since we are little. Uh, We we kind of, you know, desire to do it by ourselves. Uh, Our youngest is, um, we have, uh, for those of you that don't know, we have five kids. We have four girls and one boy. If you ever think, should I pray more for my pastor? The answer is yes, you should. Um, Our oldest is 12, and our youngest, the boy, Levi, he is turning three uh, tomorrow, okay? And so those of you first-time parents, if you're in the twos, people say terrible twos. I don't know who started that, like, misnomer, that lie. They got nothing on threes, okay? Uh, We call it the three-nagers, all right? And so we've got a three-nager starting tomorrow in our house, and he, like, got a head start. He loves, uh, he just, well, some of it is just, like, the boy thing. We're we're kind of, like, a whole new territory uh, for us. Um, uh, Don't tell him, but he's got lots of, like, Hot Wheels and different things kind of coming tomorrow. Um, He's all into uh, those sorts of things. Um, if you're watching Levi at home, uh, my family's home this morning. Um, sorry, I just ruined your birthday. But um, we, uh, you know, he loves to do things by himself. And if you are a parent, or even if you're not a parent, if you've spent any time around a little little one, that can be so frustrating to watch, can it not? Like when they, you are convinced that there is no way they are going to do this, but they are convinced that they are not letting anyone help. And so you are uh, just watching and being the one who's capable or able, you know there is nothing in your power. You don't have the skills necessary to be able to accomplish whatever it is that you're trying to do right now. You need help. But sometimes they just dig their heels in and you just have to wait for a week or two. And it, it, it can be so, so frustrating. And here's the thing. I don't know if we ever truly grow out of that. I think sometimes we have this misconception that we can do things all on our own. And I can imagine what our Heavenly Father is like looking down, watching us uh, from where his vantage point is, his, his ability to see all things and to know all things. And as he is there and he's with us, he sees and knows that the things that we're trying to do on our own are not going to work. There's just no way we can do it all by ourselves. Thankfully, he doesn't expect us to do things all by ourselves. He has given us as his church, his spirit, which is at work within us. And on top of that, he's given us one another. He's given us the church. And last week, we began this letter to uh, the church in Thessalonica, and we saw the way that Paul was highlighting these ever so crucial relationships within the church. And he begins, uh, he says in verse one, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. I mean, already in that passage, if you remember from last week, he's speaking to these, the, the way that God has brought them together. Like, there's no reason that all of them should know each other. And he speaks to their position together in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks truth over their life. And, and that this grace is, is something that God holds out to you. It's his peace that's found in his grace. And then he goes on and he says, we give thanks to God always For all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
He's declaring these realities of the, the, what the gospel has done in their lives, and he's reminding them, hey, I'm praying for you. I'm going to the Lord for you, and he is working. And so we see that there are what we can call gospel relationships at work in the church, and this is a unique relationship. This isn't like the buddies at work. This isn't like uh, the friends down the street. This isn't just your classmates. These are unique relationships that we share because of our position in Christ Jesus. And they've been brought about by the gospel. And so as we continue today, we're going to see that Paul continues to build on this theme. And he's continuing to encourage the church in this example that they're setting out for other believers in this. And that's what we're calling it this morning, um, an example to all, because this is really what the church of Thessalonica was. Even this young church just started, just getting going. They were already an example to all. Like word was being spread about what God was up to, what was happening there in Thessalonica, and how that could be reproduced in other places, the way that, the way that they were responding to and, and, and worshiping God uh, together in that place. And so let me just give you the big idea that we're going to see this morning. It's this. Together, we imitate the living hope given to us as an example for others. Together, we imitate the living hope given to us as an example for others. Let me just point out, though, in that statement, a very, very crucial word is that very first word, together. Together. Everything that we are talking about for the rest of our time this morning is to be done together. Like this is not something that you can do on your own. We don't get to say, I'm going to do this one by myself. We can't. We can't. And so let's just kind of just get that in our heads right now as we're in this. We're in this place together. We are together in this. And together we get to imitate this hope as an example for others, those around us. And we're going to see that, that Paul is calling the church to have these four marks together. These four things are present in the community that, that, is, that is living out this living hope for others. These are commitments. These are, these are things that are, are, are to be found in the God's people, in the church here, if we're going to live out this living hope for others. So that's where we're going this morning. Let me just pray that God would uh, teach us now as we open his word. Our God, we are thankful for your word. And these are your words to us. God, you have given us this for our growth, God, for your glory. We want to learn from you right now. And so, God, together we are approaching this passage, Lord, this letter which you have preserved for us, which you have given to us through your spirit. And so, would you teach us now as we examine it, would you help us as we seek to apply it to our own hearts and to our own lives, and God, be changed by it? Would, you, um, would your spirit be at work in us? We thank you for the power of your word, and we ask that you would teach us in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. So together we imitate the living hope given to us as an example for others. What are the things that need to be present in order to do that? Let's look at the passage. Let me read verse 4 for us. 1 Thessalonians verse 4, it says, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you, not only in word, but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. Here's the first sort of mark of this community, this church that is about uh, seeing the living hope, this model, this example to all. We have to be grounded in the loving choice of God. There is a grounding that is found in the loving choice of God. That comes straight from this passage. Look back at verse four again. For we know, Paul is writing with confidence here, there's not a doubt in his mind as he's writing to that church. We know this, church. Like, this is true about you, and we want to remind you of this truth. And he says, brothers, don't worry, sisters. That's a generic term there. If your Bible has a little note like mine does, it says brothers or sisters. It's kind of this, this generic, it's, it's family. It's, hey, siblings, uh, brothers or sisters. And so he's, he's writing to them and saying, hey, as the family of God, we know this. What do we know? Well, we know that you are loved by God. God. 
See, now, we sometimes, we repeat this truth so often in church or maybe in our relationships that, that maybe it kind of has this sentimental feel to it, but can we just stop and think about that for a second? God, the God, the creator God, the God over the entire universe, he not only knows you, but he loves you. He loves you. By his own choosing, by his own efforts, by his own working, he chose you, he chose to love you. And he chose to make his, known, his love known to you. He expressed his love through his son, Jesus Christ, but he says, loved by God. He goes on and says, it gets even better, that he has chosen you. He's chosen you. And sometimes we come across this word and we're like, I don't know if I like that word. What do you mean he chose me? Listen, listen, church. If you come across that word and you hear anything but an encouragement and love, then you're reading it wrong. Every time that, God, that the Bible talks about God's sovereign choice in the working in the lives of those believers, that is meant to be an encouragement to you. This is repeated throughout scripture. We see it several places. The primary places, if you want to know more about God's sovereign choosing in your life, would be Ephesians 1 or Romans 9. But let me just tell you this. It's this, is that God, before time, he saw forward into your life and he chose that you would know him, that you would respond to him. He chose to love you and to make his love known to you. See, that should encourage us. That should bring us to this place. Like, who am I that God would choose me? Who am I that he would show my love, his love toward me? You see, he's writing and he's saying, listen, I am confident of these things. Well, how could Paul be confident in that? Like, how would he choose somebody to know? He's like, you don't want to know how I know God chose you? It's because of the outworking that I see of God in your life. Look what he says. He goes on to, to speak about what God has done. He says, this is how I know, because our gospel, when we told you about the good news of Jesus Christ, our gospel, when it came to you, it was not only in word. Like, it wasn't just kind of this, like, nod your head and kind of go along with it sort of thing. It wasn't just this exchange of, of words, this kind of exchange of ideas and things went by. No, no, there was transformation, there was change. He says it wasn't only in word, but it was in power, and it was in the Holy Spirit, and it was with full conviction. You see, you have to understand the, 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 the backdrop of how the gospel came to Thessalonica. We talked about it a little bit last week, but Paul shows up with his ministry team. He's there with Silas, and we don't know at what point Timothy was there, but, but they're there, and they're ministering there, and they come into this town, which was a, a, a prominent city. It was a free city. It had special standing with Rome. It was um, a, a, like a hopping city. It was on the trade route. It had all these things going for it, and more than that, it is um, this relationship with Rome. It's a polytheistic city. There are temples and different gods and, and opportunities to worship all over the place. And Paul rolls in, he goes to the synagogue, and he spends a few days unpacking what is known as the good news, the gospel. And he says, listen, uh, Caesar is not God. Jesus Christ is God. He is the true and living hope. He is the Lord over all things. And more than that, he has died on your behalf that you might know him, that there might be forgiveness for your sins. These sacrifices, these worship, these, these ritual things that you're kind of walking through, you don't have to do any of that. You have a savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He was, uh, he was from Nazareth and he, he, he lived a life that, of perfection and he went to the cross for you. And he, not only that, he died and he is raised from the grave. He's alive today. He's seated at the right hand of the father and he loves you. This is the good news of the gospel that Paul brought to this, this city and they received it. They responded in full conviction with the power of the Holy Spirit. And what Paul is doing in that moment is he is bringing them back to this grounding that needs to happen in the life of the believer. So you have to be grounded in God's loving choice for you. Again, I don't want to split hairs. I know that this has been, uh, maybe you grew up in a church that this was like the, the hot button topic and kind of talking about this. And people ask me all the time, like, do we believe in God's sovereign choice or do we believe in man's free will? And I always say, yes. 
Yes, we do. You know why I say yes? Because God talks about both in his word. All right, both are present. We are called to choose. We are called to respond. But we see that God does something special and he chooses apart from us. And if you're trying to reconcile that, good luck with that, okay? We're talking about the infinite God of the universe. And so if you want that to all fit into a nice box that you can put a bow on, I just think your vision of God is too small. Like there's some things that he's going to have that we're not going to be able to fully comprehend. And so can I just call you past whatever sort of hang up you might have with that word? Like, what do you mean he chose me? Does that mean he doesn't choose others? Listen, what God's word says is that he chose you. Do you know who else he chose? No, you don't. You don't know how he's working. You don't know what he's doing. It does say this. It says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. See, we hold on to that promise. We, we hold out the gospel for all people. But here's the thing that we need to remember is that if you are here and you are in Christ today, God chose you. He did a special work in your heart, in your life, and he brought you to that place. You know what, sometimes I, I've heard it said this way, this side of eternity, maybe it looks a lot like we chose. I think on the other side of eternity, we're just gonna see how much God was active in that choosing. And I'm okay with him sorting all that out and figuring that out. He's God, I'm not. But here's what we have to do is that we have to hold this truth out for one another. What Paul is doing in this moment is the same thing that you and I need to do. He's declaring the truth of God's work in their lives. We need this for each other. We need to do this for one another. You need this done for you. Where does this happen? Well, I think one great place is obviously small group. As we discuss God's word, we remind ourselves of the reality of what God has done. And so we can speak this to each other. But that doesn't, that's not just the only place. We need to be in and a part of each other's lives and having conversations with others that we would declare not just this truth, but gospel realities that we would speak the truth, that we would point people toward God's loving choosing. Hey, God has worked in your life in a special way. Do you know that? Do you, do you, can you remember that? Can you, that? That is a place that we need to be grounded in. It draws us out of ourselves and out of this, this sort of self-centered under, understanding of who we are and what we need. And it gets us looking above. It, looks, it gets us looking up toward him. And it looks us, gets us looking toward others in that. We understand that God has worked in a special way. And so who in your life needs to hear this gospel reality this week? It doesn't have to be weird, okay? Like, hey, I just want to tell you something. I just want to remind you something. You can write someone a note. You can send them a text. You can say, hey, I just, you just need to know that God loves you and he chose you and he is at work in your life. We try and declare this here at our church that we would be grounded in the loving choice of God. That is the reason that each and every week we end our service with this declaration. What do we say? How do we close our service? You are loved. You are loved. Every box of food that we handed out this last time, we had a little sticker on it. It says, you are loved. You are loved. God loves you. And by extension, we love you. Because God loved us, we can love you. You are loved. And so let's have a grounding. That's, that's what we want to hear as the last things that we walk out is that you are loved. We want to embody this in the very ethos of our church, how we operate. We want to express and extend and show God's love to one another. This would be our grounding. You are loved by God and you are loved here in this place by us because God has loved us. A, com a, a community, a church community that is an example to all begins here with this grounding in God's loving choice. Here's the next thing he continues. Let me give it to you and I'll show it to you in scripture. It, the second thing is a commitment to replicating the work of God. A commitment to replicating the work of God. Here's what we mean by that. Look at verse six. It says, in you, Paul's speaking about, again, their, their story. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. Notice here a couple of the words that are used there. You became imitators of us. That means you followed after us. You followed our example. 
Uh, There's a replication that's going on there. When Paul and Silas show up, they're living out their faith before the lives of these, these, these men, these women that they're meeting for the very first time. And they got driven out of town quickly, right? There was an uprising, a mob uh, heard about what was happening, or there was men that heard about what was happening. And so this mob formed and they drove Paul and Silas out of town. They were only there for a short period of time. The church was just getting started, but they were with them long enough to point them towards scripture and to say, listen, this is how our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ lived. So should you. And what these men, what these women began to do is they lived as imitators of Paul and Silas and of the Lord Jesus Christ. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. Paul says that throughout his word. He says, hey, follow me as I follow Christ. He's like, you want to know how to live like Christ? Look at my life and live how I'm living. What a lofty like, quest. What a lofty goal that we would have for others. That we would be able to say, hey, if you want to know how Christ lived, watch me and live like this. Would that be the goal for all of us, though? That we would live in such a way that we could say, hey, if you want to know, I'm not doing everything perfectly, but I have gotten, like, God has been at work in my life, and he's helped me figure a few things out, and so I do know how to do this. You can watch me in this as I follow Christ. It's not perfection, but it's growth. You became imitators of us, and you received the word in much affliction. Just a reminder, again, of the affliction that rose up. Paul had to leave quickly, And they were under persecution from day one. It was never easy for them. But yet, look at what they had. They had the joy of the Holy Spirit in and through all of that. We are never promised that every day, all of our time will be easy, that it will go uh, smoothly, that, that there will not be conflict or affliction. No, the opposite is said. If you hear somebody say, hey, you, you should not be affliction, experiencing affliction as a, as a believer in the life of the believer, don't listen to that person. They're not reading from the Bible. Rather, what is promised to us is not the freedom from affliction, but rather sustaining joy from the Holy Spirit in the midst of affliction. And that was their story. They, from day one, had the sustaining joy of the Spirit in the midst of affliction. And so what happened then as a result? Well, You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. They were replicating this work. They were going and they were sharing and they were telling others and they were showing others of what they had done. Even in this affliction, the joy of the Spirit was working this out and this was our story collectively as a church as we began. When we first started as a church, we had other churches that were instrumental in getting us started. We had a coaching church, we had sending churches, we had um, churches that were uh, just kind of partners and participating with us, and there were many things that we looked at those churches and we said, you know what, we want to imitate that, like we want to be like that, we want to hold on to that, or that's, that is clearly what God has called the church to be, and so we are going to do that. There's all these things that we imitated other churches, but our prayer has been this, is that as God has established us as a church, and we're still in kind of our baby days, like we are still a young church, okay, Make no mistake, God is just kind of getting started. We have a lot of things to learn, but one of my prayers has been for our church is that we would be able to be an example for other churches. Not because of some lofty high goal, oh, I hope that they really look to us and and think of us as the sort of gold standard of that. No, 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 not like that. But that we want to see the work of God replicated. And so if there's some things that God's doing here and he's moving and working powerfully in certain ways, we want to see that replicated. I pray that the the church of Dane County, all the churches of Dane County, that we would be building one another up and that there's some things that we're doing that would be spurring on other churches to continue in the same way. And likewise, that we would look to other churches and that we would be spurred on and that we would be encouraged and that we would be challenged to to grow in certain ways. I mean, that is how the church is supposed to function. And this young church in Thessalonica, even in their their youth, just beginning started, they were examples to all the churches, to all the believers throughout Macedonia and Achaia. Their God was replicating this work. Well, I give this example sort of corporately, but how about personally? What about in your life? Is this happening? Or what about the life of your family? Parents, if you've got children, how are you living this out before them? I would just ask you this question, two, two, actually two questions. The first is, who are you looking to to imitate as you follow Christ? Who are the people that you're looking to that, you know what, I want to do some things like them. 
We're called to replicate one another in this way. As, we, as you see someone following Christ, so you can follow them. I would just really encourage you to do that. I've, I've done that in many different areas of my life. I have some pastors that are like a little further down the road than me and I look to them and I say, you know what? Uh, what are they doing? How is God working in them? How has God taught them things? I have conversations with them. I say, hey, how did you navigate this transition or how did you grow in this? Or what? I mean, I'm imitating other men and women in those areas of ministry. I also have men and women that are uh, further down the road in parenting. I mentioned we're entering, you know, the three nagers, well, this summer we're entering the actual teenagers. Our, our oldest is turning 13. Now, I um, you know, did student ministry for almost 15 years, and so I am an expert in all things related to uh, teenagers. And I know that my kids are going to be like a breeze because of that, right? Right? Yeah, yeah. No, you're like, yeah, yeah, it's different when they're your own, right? And so here's the thing. I am looking to others, and I am, I'm, what, who can I learn from? How can I have? And we've had people in our parenting that we have looked to, and we said, hey, can you teach us? Can you help us? I don't think I'm going to make it through this stage. Uh, you know, we need help. And we've looked to others to imitate them. There's been parts or, or just different facets of my life, different you know, moves, transitions, things that I've been growing in, things that I've been searching, looking to others. Who can I imitate in that? We want to replicate that. So I would ask the question, who are you imitating in your life? Who are you looking to? The second question is, who's looking at you? Who is looking to you to imitate you? Now, that might be a scary question to ask because on one hand, there might be some people looking to you and you maybe don't like the things that they're replicating. I get terrified of that as a parent because my kids get to see all the good and all the bad, all right? I'm not always holding up a Bible and preaching, okay? I, I have a lot of other hours in my week, and so my kids get to see me at my best, and they see me at my worst, and what are they looking to? What are they replicating? But make no mistake, they are replicating it. They are learning from me. What am I showing them in the way that I'm living that out? So maybe there's some people following you that you wish didn't see all that, but maybe, maybe you look around and you're like, I don't know if anyone's looking to me. See, as a believer, this isn't like an optional thing, the kind of this add-on that's just for like sort of the super believers. This is standard operating practice for Christians. We are to be looking to others, imitating others, and we are to be sharing that with those around us. And so I would just encourage you, if you don't have people, you might not think that you have much, but there are things that God has done or is doing in your life, and you can share those with others. How are you replicating yourself for the sake of the gospel? This is what a church that is an example to all is doing. It's, it's ingrained in them. There's this commitment to the replicating work of God. We want to see this reproduced. And so in our small groups, would we be replicating together that we would be challenging as iron, sharpens, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, that we would be doing this together, that we are looking to those, learning from others, and replicating in this work of the gospel in our lives. Let's continue on. Look at number three, third mark, third commitment of a church that wants to be an example to others. It's this. Devotion to sharing the good news of God. There's a devotion to it. There's a commitment around that. There's a, there's a, 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 a central aim at that. Look at verse eight. Not only, for not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything what a statement for Paul to say. He's like, already the story of what you're doing, you're the, 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 the word of God, that is the word of the Lord, the, the good news of the gospel is sounding forth. It is, it is ringing out from you and from this position that God has you and this, in this prime place of a port and in this prime place where, where there's a major trade route, people are coming and going and as they're coming and going, as business is being done and, and people are returning back to their cities, the gospel is going out from you. It's sounding forth and there's a devotion that they had toward this. They are spreading the work of what God has done everywhere. Now, you might under, not understand just how significant that is because you come across these words. We've now seen them a couple times, Macedonia and Achaia. That probably doesn't mean much to you. And so um, it's time for everybody's favorite part of the sermon when we show you a map. You ready for a map? Um, here's a map 
of, uh, of what, what we're talking about here. We got it online too? Yeah, nice. Um, and so uh, right there, I put the nice red star. That is Thessalonica. It is part of what is now modern day Greece. Uh, I've talked about that port. You can see it's like just kind of tucked in there. It's, it's nice. And the Ignatian Way is, is there, that dotted line kind of flowing right through Thessalonica. But Thessalonica was in this region which was known as Macedonia. It's pretty massive. It's a huge region. And Paul is writing from the city of Corinth. You can see it down there toward the south, just above where it says Achaia. And so this, the, the region to the south is Achaia. And what he's saying there is all the way from like Philippi in Macedonia, all the way down to Corinth and even Sparta in Achaia, all of this in Macedonia and Achaia, the word of the Lord is sounding forth from your small church. Like it's amazing the impact that they are having there. And this is all before like social media and text messaging and, 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 and Zoom and all of that. Like this is all just happening. And so I can imagine, you know, what Paul's experiencing here is, uh, you know, he says, not only is the word of God, Lord of the Lord, sounding forth from you, Macedonia, Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. I love that. I can just picture it. Like Paul pulls up and he guys, goes to town. He sits down with a group of believers and he's like, hey, let me tell you about what God is doing in Thessalonica. It's incredible. I cannot wait to share this good news with you. And they're all like, yeah, we already know. You've ever had that happen, right? You're like, hey, I got some exciting things to tell you. And like, yeah, I already know. And you're like, oh, man. Like, all right, well, uh, yeah. So Paul is showing up and he has this news. He has, he has this exciting thing and they all know. And so he goes to the next town. He's like, hey, let me tell you what's happening in Thessalonica. God is doing some incredible work there. And they already know. He's like, everywhere we go, they already know. This word is sounding forth. I think it's because of their location, because of the prominent spot that God had them in. The word is sounding forth everywhere. Everywhere. I love this. But here's the thing, is that was not just happening by chance. That wasn't just a natural byproduct of anything. They were devoted to that. They were sharing the gospel of the Lord in everything that they did. As they were doing their business dealings, they were telling people about Jesus. As they were traveling to other cities, they were sharing their faith in God and what God was doing in their midst. They were an example to all the believers in this. And I would say for many of us, sometimes that sharing our faith piece, that sharing the gospel piece gets put on the, uh, I'm going to get around to it list. Do you have one of those at home? I have one of those at home. My get around to it list. Uh, you know, things that you really should do, um, but they're not necessarily pressing and you don't have a like, concrete plan of when it's going to happen. Um, embarrassingly so, when we got into our house, there was this like tiny little leak near one of our showers and there was like kind of this dis- discoloration I sort of noticed. And I was like, oh, I just need to put a little bit of caulk right there. It'll fix it. I even bought the caulk. I still have not put the caulk, all right? It's still spreading. I, like, I, get, I, I see it literally every single day. It's in our bathroom every day. I'm showering. There it is. I see it. I'm like, I need to fix that. That's not actually good for the drywall or for anything else. I need to fix it. Now, I don't think it's like doing too, before you judge me too hard, okay? I don't think there's like long-term structural damage happening, okay? It's just like a little bit of paint, a little patch. It's going to be okay. But I have not done that. It's on my list. I have no like concrete plan on how to get that done. I even bought the caulk. That's the worst part. It's like sitting in my garage. And we have now lived in our house for three years, and it is still not done. A couple years ago, we got, or a year and a half ago, we got a really good deal on a new uh, refrigerator. And we were so excited about this refrigerator because we needed a bigger refrigerator. There's seven of us, and we eat some food in our house. And uh, our little tiny uh, refrigerator was not going to cut it. And so we got a little bigger refrigerator, but it didn't fit in the space that we had. So we took out a couple cabinets around it because the plan was that we were going to remodel the kitchen like shortly after. Well, now a year and a half has passed, and there's still like just this big gap around our refrigerator. And it's, it's, it's terrible because there's not really a plan. Now, we try to do it. Try to, again, I feel like this need, I don't know if this is just me, there's some insecurities coming out as I'm sharing this. I now feel all this need to justify this to you, okay? So we were going to fix it this summer. We were going to remodel and the cabinets that we went to get were totally sold out because everybody's remodeling, right? It was like the summer of remodeling. Everyone was like HDTV at home and they're just like kind of going for it. 
And so that's kind of what happened for us is we went to do it and we didn't do it, but we, don't, we, we need to do it. There's just not a concrete plan for getting it done, much to the dismay of my wife. Our deck would fall on that. It needs to be restained this year, but we haven't really done it because it really needs replacing. It's getting a little more shaky. And so it's just kind of, it's one of those things. We have these like things that are kind of on our list. We know they need to be done, but we don't have any concrete plan of actually getting them done. So here's the problem with that. I think sometimes we take sharing our faith. We hear a sermon like this. We hear it mentioned. We've actually talked about it several times over the last few months. Hey, we need to be active in sharing our faith in God with those around us. They need to hear the hope of the gospel. And you might in that moment say, yes, you're right. Yes, I know I need to. But then we walk out and nothing changes. It gets put on the, yeah, it needs to be done, but I don't have a concrete plan list. We need to take it off that list. This week, how are we doing to do it? How are we going to share our faith in God with those around us? We need to be devoted to this church. If you don't know where to start, can I just encourage you, start with prayer. If you don't have a list of people that you are praying for, for God's work, get a list going. You should have at least a few names on that list. People that you are praying would come to know the saving faith of Jesus Christ in their life. Paul is affirming this and he's celebrating them in this. We need to do this. Maybe, maybe the way that you share the faith of what God has done in your life is you want to record what we call testimony videos here. Every so often, we do these videos of how God has worked in our lives. And maybe you just want to share the story of God's work in your life. Maybe how he brought you to faith in Christ. Or maybe since then, how he's taught you something or he's, he's transformed something in your life. Or, or, you know, what? we would love to share that story of what God has done. We should have a list of the people that we're praying for. And more than that, we should have some people around us that also have that list. Ask your small group to partner with you, to join with you. When somebody shares, hey, I'm going to be sharing my faith this week, or I'm going to have this conversation with so-and-so at work this week, can you pray for that? Let's be committed to that. Let's pray for that. Let's be devoted for that together. See, this cannot live on the I'm going to get around to it list. This has to be at the forefront. This is what this church was about, and God was ringing it out. See, in a similar way, I don't think we have to make a far jump from Thessalonica to Madison, but we live in a pretty strategic place here in this state. There are so many people that come from towns here to Madison to go to school. There are people coming from all over the world, all over the country to come to school here in this city. There are people that come here to work at giant tech companies here in the city that like, only last for a few years and then go somewhere else. Right? We have opportunities here in this city that we can pour forth into others and then it can go forth. I think that we are in a strategic place to be able to reach not just Dane County, but other cities around our state with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that, church? You don't have to be a massive church to get that done. By God's grace, already we're praying and excited about the church plant that is already developing and uh, Blake and Jenna passed their assessment this last week, and so we're so encouraged and excited about that. We're gonna be, you're going to be hearing more about that, but we're planting a church in Monroe, Lord willing, this fall. We'd love to see that happen in the next year for sure. We want to see God establish a new work there, and that all comes from our devotion to sharing the good news of God. People need to hear of who Jesus is and what he's done on their behalf. And here's the fourth thing. Would this be true of us, church, that we would resolve to serve the true and living God? It was a transformation for the Thessalonians. It's a transformation for us. But in verse 9, it says this. Listen, this is the report that is going forth. They themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you. What kind of reception was that, Paul? Well, they turned, how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the hope. This is the living hope that they were holding on to. And they were resolved in that to serve this true and living God. They are sharing not just the gospel, but they're sharing the story of God's transforming work in their lives. And as, a special stand, as the city with a special standing with Rome, they actually were granted permission to be one of the cities of an imperial cult. And uh, so they had temples 
uh, throughout the city, specifically for the Roman government, for um, the emperor, uh, for, you know, for Rome. And in, in addition to all of the other gods that were being worshipped in and around the city. And so this is the place that these, these believers, these now believers in Jesus, grew up in and were commonplace for them. But yet Paul rolls in and he says this. He says, there is one God and he is true as living and his, he sent his son and his name is Jesus Christ and he is the living hope. What they did is they received that and they turned from their idols and they began to serve this living and true God. No longer many gods, but only one God. And that is the truth of scripture, church. It says, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody, nobody comes to the Father but through me. That is very exclusive claim. There are no other gods that are going to save you. There are no other idols that are going to deliver. This is the truth that was preached in Thessalonica, and they received it, and they turned, and they began to worship. They began to serve the living and the true God. Not only that, but they were waiting for his return. They're looking for the return of the son from heaven because he was raised to dead and he, he ascended unto heaven. And he's coming back. But who is this Jesus? Well, he delivers us from the wrath to come. That is what made all of the difference. You see, when they came to Christ, they set all of that aside and began to worship the one, the true, the living God. And that is the truth of scripture, right? We believe in one God. He exists in three persons, I know that part gets confusing, but it is one God. One God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We believe in one God. And it was quite a revolutionary change for them. And you might think, you know what? I'm not really quite in that same spot. Maybe that's not your story. You didn't turn from, you know, kind of an idol. You didn't have an idol made of wood in your home or something like that. Maybe you don't go to the temple and offer sacrifices to worship or uh, in homage to, uh, you know, the government, like Washington, D.C. or something like that, like you're not, you know, calling out to these different gods of, 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 of uh, you know, the, the agriculture or, or fertility or all these other things, but let's make no mistake, we are no different. We have idols in our heart. C.S. Lewis says our hearts are idol factories. We have so, so many things that we worship with our time, with our attention, with our money, we go to idols all the time. And this is what God has called us out of, to turn aside from our idols and put our attention on the true and the living God and to begin to serve him and him alone, the one, the true, the living God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from dead. The reason of this is this, is that he's delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's just be clear about this, is that if you are not in Christ, you have no protection over the wrath, from the wrath of God. Listen, we are all born into this place. We are deserving of God's wrath because we have sinned against him and him alone. We have fallen short of his glory, his standard, his righteousness. We have no protection over his wrath and that's where Jesus stepped in. Jesus, when he went to the cross, it says that he bore the full wrath of God upon him. He drank the whole cup. There's nothing left for us in Christ Jesus. It says that he delivers us from the wrath to come. That is the message of the gospel. That's what the gospel holds out. That's why we're so devoted to sharing that message is because there is no other protection but through Jesus Christ. And I would just say for some of you, this is the action step for you today is that you need to turn from the idols and you need to acknowledge and begin to serve the true and living God. And I would call you to do that today. If you're at home, that's an option for you at home. You don't have to be here in this place. Don't harden your heart toward the Lord. Would you turn toward the true and living God, begin to serve him because he is the one that can bring you protection from God's wrath to come. He already bore it on the cross. He wants to bear it for you. This is the truth of the gospel. And if you are in Christ, this is what this passage is calling us to is that we would then live like it. That we would live like it that we wouldn't live in a way that, that would go back to these things. This is, this is what we've been called out of, church. Like, we've been called away from these things, that, we, that, we wouldn't, that they're never going to satisfy, they're never going to save us, they're never going to deliver. These are what he has said, so that we would turn from our idols, serve the true and living God, and wait for his son in heaven. He's delivered us from that wrath to come. 
So I would just ask this, what's, what idols still remain? What sin still remains? What are the things that you run back to, that you go after, that you've hidden away? You cannot serve two masters. God has called us to turn from the idols in our life and to turn to a much better, much more gracious God. It's him. It's our heavenly father. It's our savior, Jesus Christ. And we've been called to worship and serve and to love him. And that church is where we find our living hope. And so together, let's not lose this. Together, this, these are the things that we get to live out. This is what allows us to be an example for others, that others would look towards us, that we would be devoted and committed to these things, that we would have a true devotion around God's loving choice and his work in our life, that we would be committed to replicating that work that God has done, that we would see that done in others, that we would share the good news of God with those who have not yet heard and that we would resolve to serve him in every way, that we would leave sin behind, that we would deal with the sin in our lives and serve the true and living God. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge, we acknowledge the great work, God, that you have done on our behalf. Lord, the good news is not the story of cheap grace, but it was costly. God, it was the life of your own son, Jesus Christ, and so we are so thankful for that. We're thankful for the protection of your wrath that is found in believing in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And so, God, we do that. We look to you. We hold on to, with hope and with faith, this offer that you've set out before us, that we would believe and receive your gift of free life in our lives. God, that your righteousness would be counted towards us, that we would receive your righteousness. God, that your victory over death would be counted towards us, that we will receive life eternal with you. And Lord, thank you that you hold this out to us all. I just pray that we would respond, God, that we would live this out, that we would live differently together in this way. This isn't something we do alone, but God, we do this together. And so help us to do this together as a church. God, we love you. We thank you. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.